Okay, so um, it's Janet, and I want to welcome you to our live event. Um, this is part of our uh, cyber cyber-based interdisciplinary science educators course. Um, we are very excited. We're presenting. Uh, we, our presenter today is polar researcher Elliot Friedman, and he's from uh, Cornell. He's going to be talking about work that he's been conducting in the Arctic around terrestrial methane and microbiology. It's Wednesday, April 4th, 2012. And before we turn, start the presentation with um, with Elliot, there's a few things about um, this platform that we're using. It's called Blackboard Collaborate. Um, the content should be changing in the center of the room for you. And you should see um, where on your screen a list of participants. And you should also have access to a chat room and be able to type in there and post questions or relay information back and forth to all of us that are participating today. Um, if at any time you have a question, you can type it in there. Since there are a lot of us that are on live today, you can also uh, just click the little hand icon to list the participants, um, and that lets us know you have a question. We'll go to you uh, live. Um, and I don't think anybody's calling from a phone, so that's all right. And again, this is being archived, and we'll send out the archive uh, link to everybody as well as post it on the website. Um, so real quickly, we will do some quick participant introductions. Um, just so you recognize my voice, Janet Warburton. I'm the project manager at Polar Trek, working here at Arcus in Fairbanks, Alaska. And my name is on the Polar Trek program, um, again, here in Fairbanks. And we have a couple people that are just joining us, but we'll go to uh, Julia. Can you introduce yourself? Um, I'm Julia. I work for um, Elk Meadow School teaching high school science. We are a correspondence school. Distance learning for homeschool kids. We have students all over, actually all over the world. I live in the um, in the Adirondack Mountains of New York State. And Julia, can you tell us a little bit about why you're interested in polar science and maybe taking this class? Why why it's of interest to you? Yeah, I just find I need to uh, immerse myself more in what's really going on because kind of to liven up my teaching. And also, I love uh, being in the polar regions. <laughs> and uh, I just would love to spend more time there. And uh, it's just really exciting to learn the new stuff. OK, excellent. Welcome. I don't know if Noah, you can hear me or not, but Noah, um, talk. I think it's working, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm with the Southern Schools Program located in Colorado, and it's an outreach program that keeps mostly renewable energy as a solution to climate change, but uh, I'm really interested in methane as a change factor. Great. All right. Thank you, Noah, and welcome. Um, and Alex, I don't know if you have a mic. I see you typing away. Um, and uh, Alex does not have um, access to a mic, so she'll introduce herself um, through the chat feature. Okay, uh, so real quickly, uh, I think everybody, um, at least uh, maybe the only person that's online today that might not know what uh, Polar Trek is, um, but just for people that might be listening to this archive as well, um, we are hosting the Sea Ice class in this event through the Polar Trek program that stands for Teachers and Researchers Exploring and Collaborating, and we pair teachers with researchers and place them in the uh, polar regions for experiences. Um, this is a national science funded project and through the Office of Polar Programs. And we have funding until the year 2014. Um, and the sea ice class itself is a way to connect uh, teachers with researchers and polar researchers so that you get um, some more content knowledge about what is happening in the polar regions, even if you can't go there on these research expeditions. So, with that, Elliot, I'm going to turn it over to you. And I will be quiet on this end. And I'll let you introduce yourself and, uh, and navigate the slides. So 
Welcome. We don't hear you, Elliot. There, I forgot about the talk button. So, there, you go. there we go. So, uh, my name is Elliot. I'm a PhD candidate at Cornell University. I'm in the Department of Biological and Environmental Engineering. And um, you can feel free to interrupt at any time if you have questions. But basically, um, what we're going to talk about today is some methane and microbiology in the polar regions and some of the work that we're doing up there. So uh, a little background about myself. Um, I did an undergraduate degree in environmental engineering from Lehigh University, which is in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And then I came up here to Cornell um, directly after that. And I've been here for just under three years now. And um, this coming summer will be our fourth season in the Arctic. Um, working in Barrow, Alaska. So to give a little outline of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I'll go over a little, just an introduction to the North Slope. It's an area of Alaska that I find people are less familiar with than some of the other regions. Um, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of the biosensor technology, which is a, um, a new application of an existing technology that, that we've um, that we're using in the Arctic to study bacteria. And then I'll talk about the study that we're doing in, in Barrow, which specifically involves uh, iron as a respiratory process. And um, talk more about that. And then finally, a little bit about some global climate models and, and methane emissions and how they tie into that Barrow study. And yes, we had a Polar Trek teacher on the project last year, and I got an email from Jim today, and he should he said he was going to try to join us as soon as, I, as, soon as he can. I um, you know the time zones are different, and I think he also coaches swimming, so there might be some something with that. But and we will have another uh, teacher coming up with us this summer. But so basically, where we are, we're in Barrow, Alaska, and that's the red star up there, and. Uh, the yellow star I put in for reference um, is where Healy is about, and that's where Elizabeth uh, Webb, who gave the talk last week, that's where they're located. So there's quite a bit of distance between where the studies are happening. And you can see on the topographical map that uh, we have the Brooks Range that separates Healy from Barrow. And what you have above uh, the Brooks Range um, is two, about 200 uh, vertical miles of, of flat tundra. So Barrow is the northernmost city in the U.S. and one of the northernmost in the world. It's 320 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Um, there are about 4,000 people that live there. And as I mentioned, it has this flat tundra that stretches about 200 miles to the south until you reach the, reach the northern extent of the Brooks Range. Um, as a result of this, there's no wind barriers at all. Um, and they experience freezing temperatures about 324 days out of the year. Uh, in addition, it's also a desert, so it's a tundra desert. They receive less than five inches of rain equivalent per year. Um, this is rain and snow. And the other unique thing is that we, since we are above the Arctic Circle, it's dark from about November 18th to the end of January, and it's light 24 hours a day from the beginning of May until the beginning of August. So what we have is a pretty unique environment, um, and that's why we're interested in, in studying what's going on here, because it is such a unique environment. It's a large area, and also, um, as I'm sure we've all heard, the polar regions are um, more susceptible to climate change, and we've been seeing that so far. So a little bit about the North Slope topography. Um, like I said, it, it is fairly flat. Um, it's a region above the, the Brooks Range. Uh, it's fairly sparsely populated. The places that you might have heard of are Barrow, uh, Prudhoe Bay, where they drill for oil, and there are a couple other small towns, but other than that, there's not much. Um, they have very, very little amount of rain, but because the, the ground is underlain with um, permafrost, there's really n no place for this rain to go, and there's also very little vegetation and uh, wildlife there that, that's using this rain, so it kind of sticks around for a long time once it's there. And as a result, 
um, they have these lakes and rivers due to very slow evaporation, um, the freeze thawing, and the underlying bedrock. And what you can see in the middle picture on the right there is just the satellite Google Maps view of the northern part of Alaska. If you get to the little green dot, that's where Barrow is on the top. But you can kind of see that there are a lot of lakes, um, and they're covering most of the of the surface. Um, and in addition, what we have is uh, something called polygonized tundra. And what this is is if you start out with a flat um, saturated soil, once it freezes, part of the um, part of that ground will get upheaved due to the freezing. And um, this happens over and over again year by year. And as a result, you get a little bit of topography in this flat area. So you can see in the bottom picture, um, which is just an aerial view, you can see these squares and circles that are existing around this lake. And that's what we call the polygonized tundra. So the darker areas are depressions. Um, and they're typically where the water table is above the uh, soil surface. And the lighter areas are the areas that have been upheaved. So they're higher than the uh, corresponding dark areas. And hopefully you can see in the top picture, um, you can kind of see that they're, it's not totally flat, but there is some elevation change, even though it's only a few feet tall. Um, so polar carbon, I put this in there, um, even though Elizabeth mentioned this last week, but the northern circumpolar permafrost soil holds about 16,000 uh, picograms of carbon. And it's a very, very large pool of carbon. So it's up to 60% of the below ground carbon pool. And it's also um, been compared to the a similar amount of carbon that would be in the atmosphere at any given time. And polar regions are more susceptible to climate change since they are the most extreme regions of our, our planet. And what we really want to know is what happens to all this carbon as temperatures warm. And another thing that, that Elizabeth mentioned as well is we have a feed forward um, or positive feedback process. And something that, that could happen here is if we warm the tundra a little bit and as a result of it we, we kind of activate this carbon and it gets released as greenhouse gases. That will then cause more warming, which will um, kind of circle back and, and cause more release of carbon. So that's a, a reason we have a big concern for this. And, and it's a popular uh, term in, in climate change is positive feedback process. So if we look at kind of a simplified view of what's happening in the Arctic with carbon, we have kind of the three main uh, bodies, the atmosphere, the land, and the ocean. And within the land, we have the permafrost, and then we have the area, the, the section that thaws each year. And so we have basically carbon dioxide and methane traveling between the ocean and the atmosphere, and the land and the atmosphere. And then we have uh, dissolved organic and inorganic carbon and particular organic carbon that are traveling between the land and the ocean. And basically what we're interested in is uh, this area in red. So the emissions between the land and the atmosphere. That, go to the next slide there. Um, so and one thing we're particularly interested in, at least from my perspective, is methane. And methane emissions from the Arctic have increased 31% from 2003 to 2007. And it's a very small. Um, you know, window to be looking at, but that's kind of concerning to, to us, and we want to know um, what's causing that and, and what controls the methane emissions uh, from soils. And a little bit of background about methane. So the reason we're concerned about methane is because it has somewhere between 20 and 25 times the climate forcing potential of carbon dioxide. Um, and it's formed via methanogenesis, which is an uh, anaerobic process um, where organic matter is consumed by um, a class of microorganisms called methanogenic archaea, and they produce methane. And if you look down at the bottom, um, 
what you can see is uh, a current phylogenetic tree of life. So you see bacteria, archaea, and the eukaryotes. And if you look within the eukaryotes, uh, you can find the animals, that would be us. Um, and so these archaea that produce methane are, are not bacteria. They're a different class of microorganisms. They're an older class that evolved earlier. Um, and a lot of these archaea are that are still surviving are these methane producing ones. You can see, um, I think three of the seven ones there, the Methanosarcina, Methanobacterium, and the Methanococcus are all archaea that produce methane. And a major place that this occurs in the environment is in natural wetlands and rice paddies. And um, that's the major kind of natural source of, of, um, of methane. Of course, we all have for those, I don't know if everybody hears about it, but in New York we hear a lot about methane from cows, from dairy farming and, and um, cattle grazing. But um, in terms of natural uh, production, the main ecosystems in which this occurs is, is wetlands and rice paddies. And of these, somewhere between a quarter and a third of methane emissions from soil come from these high, uh, high latitude wet soils. Um, and so we'll kind of take a step back for a second and talk about uh, different types of, of microbial respiration just to give a little bit of background. And much in the way that we respire with oxygen and produce CO2, um, that, uh, the microorganisms also respire. So we have um, kind of two different classes. First, we have the, the ones that happen in aerobic environments. And typically, we're going to have the same type of aerobic respiration going on there where oxygen is the, the electron acceptor for these bacteria. And that's the dominant process under these aerobic conditions because it's the most energetically favorable. On the other hand, if we have anaerobic conditions, we can have a couple different things happening. Uh, there's anaerobic respiration in which we can use, the bacteria can use another electron acceptor other than oxygen in a similar process. It's a little less energetically favorable for them, but they can use things like nitrate, manganese, iron, or sulfate. Another class would be these methanogenic archaea, and that's a different species, um, and different things are happening. Uh, and finally, we have fermentation, which is another method. It, it, it's not um, as energetically favorable as, again, as aerobic respiration, which is the most favorable, but it's another thing that can happen in anaerobic environments. And what we know is that there are a wide variety of factors that influence which of these processes may dominate if we have anaerobic conditions. So um, environmental variables such as pH or moisture, things like that are going to control what microorganisms are um, the most dominant species. And finally, to bring it first full circle back to what uh, we're studying, we have these Arctic wetlands. And um, specifically, we look at different types of lake basins that are formed as a result of the climate and freeze-thawing process. So I mentioned that these lakes exist, and they, they are covering most of the surface, and they are there for a long time because there's no place for the water to go. But when they do drain, they then go through a cycle um, of ages, young, medium, old, and ancient, that covers somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 or more years until they come back to being a lake again. And then the whole process starts over again. And you can see some pictures of what we have going on in the different basins, but basically the young basin will be a kind of depressed uniform basin that might be a few feet below the surrounding area. And then as this freeze-thaw happening, freeze-thaw process occurs, um, and polygonized tundra starts to form, you get into this medium age basins where you can see we have some ris areas that have risen above others and some that are depressed. And finally, as this progresses through the old and the ancient, we can see this in the ancient is we almost have smaller lakes that are occurring within this larger lake basin. So these are, um, the soil in these wetlands is anaerobic because the water table is so high. So you can see, at least in the young picture, that the water is above the ground surface. So basically, all of this is going to be anaerobic, and there's lots of carbon. 
And since there's such little vegetation, vegetation, these microbial processes are crucial to the carbon balance here and very important. Another unique um, aspect is that there are high amounts of iron. And as we saw on the last slide, this is an alternate electron acceptor um, for anaerobic respiration. So in these, we're going to have competition between the bacteria that want to breathe with iron and the bacteria that want to produce methane. And if we have um, iron reduction, we're going to have CO2 emission. That's a byproduct of this iron reduction as opposed to methane produced with, by these archaea. And so that's a big question. The overarching goal of our study is what controls this balance? So the overarching question is what's the role of, of iron reduction as a dominant respiratory process in these Arctic peat soils? And now we'll move on to talk a little about the technology that we're using. Um, and so what we want to know is how do we study this? So how can we tell what's going on in the, in the soil up there, specifically on a, on a microbe level? And one of the things that we use that is the, a major focus of, of the lab that I work in here is called the microbial electrochemical system. And what we do here is that we link microbial metabolism to electronic circuitry. So you can see that we have microbes, we have an electrochemical system, and we put them together to get a microbial electrochemical system. And kind of what do, what do these systems do? Well, the first aspect, um, the first aspect to be discovered and, and widely investigated was bioenergy. And so basically we can get bacteria to produce electricity, um, to produce current and power by breathing um, in a, a microbial electrochemical system. And we can also use them for biosensing, which is what we're using them for. And that's a picture of some of our sensors installed in the tundra. And finally, we can talk about biocomputing. And what we can do here is we can actually um, get digital output from a environmental signal. And this is, has a lot of interesting applications that I won't go into now because there, um, I could talk about them for a long time. And so if we want to know more about how this works, um, what we see here on the top is we have a bacteria in green. And what it's going to do is it's going to take in some substrate. So in this case, this would be the carbon that's in the soil. And it's going to use that for energy. And it can produce some byproducts. And, and when it's done using this for energy, it's going to have an electron it needs to drop off. And in aerobic respiration, this would go to oxygen. Um, and in anaerobic respiration, it can go to one of these alternate electron acceptors, in this case, iron. So it will give this electron to iron 3 in the environment and reduce it to iron 2. And what we can do is we can actually put a physical piece of graphite, so just like you'd find in a pencil, into the ground. And if we control it, and we can make the bacteria think that this is iron. And so that's what we have on the bottom here. So if we replace, um, if we put the biosensor probe into the ground and we control it with an electrical controller, we make the bacteria think that it's iron. So they will actually breathe with this piece of carbon that we put in the ground. And we can then measure the amount of electrons coming in and we can look at that change over time. And that's what we're doing. So we have some type of quantitative measure of how many bacteria are breathing with iron in the environment. So the first major step of my thesis was to build these electrical controllers. They exist um, and are commercially available for use in the, um, oh, OK, I just saw a question from Julia. OK, so how do we make the bacteria think that it's iron? Well, so basically what we do is we're, um, we use the electrical controller to poise this uh, piece of carbon in the soil at the same electric potential of iron. So if you were to look at a, um, a tower, a redox tower of chemical potentials for, for iron 3, we would set the um, electrical controller to make this piece of carbon at the same, be at the same potential. Does that make sense? 
Okay, cool. I think I lost some slides. Lost. I can't see slides anymore here. Okay. Uh, so just tell us uh, which one you want to go to for a moment, and. Um, okay, I think I'm on the electrical electrical controller, controller slide. Okay. Are, can you see that now again, or no? Uh. No, I cannot. Oh, weird. Okay, well, I, I, you have your presentation, I'm sure, around, but I sent you that PDF, so I mean, it's just exactly the same as you set it up. We can kind of click through these for you if you'd like. Okay. Or you can erase them and come back. Yeah, and I'm going to, oh, you know what? Let's see, why are you not a moderator? There you are, you're still there. I'm going to knock you off being a moderator and bring you back on. We'll see what happens. Okay. Does that help at all? Nope, but I can uh, I can keep going here. It's not a big deal. Um, okay. So basically what I wanted to show you with this uh, picture uh, or this slide is that um, it took me uh, a little bit of time to develop this electrical controller because it's uh, they're basically available commercially for us to buy and we have them in a the lab, but they're very expensive and they're very fragile. And um, we couldn't bring that out to the Arctic and put it in the middle of the wetland. So um, I have basically stripped it down and built it back up from the ground again. And um, I can tell you about the electronics if you're interested, but basically what this slide was, was going to tell us that this took a long time. So we went through prototyping, revisions, testing in the lab, changes to the prototypes, testing them in the field, um, in, um, oh, 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 there it is. Now. Okay. And I have the presentation up separately, so we're good. So, and then finally, we went into production, and what we did was we produced um, basically 27 of these biosensors that we could put into the ground. Wow. And then we went out, and we put we put it then in the ground. So um, on the top left is the actual um, sensors that go in the ground. And you can see that the black pieces coming out of the bottom are the, are the actual carbon and the graphite materials that the bacteria grow on and, um, and breathe with. And then there are a couple pictures of the, these in the soils. And, and there are also some other probes around them where we're measuring other things. And Finally, on the bottom right, we can see is uh, we have an overview of our one site. So we've got some power. Um, it's powered by a solar panel, um, which is great because we can basically put these wherever we want. We don't need to have access to infrastructure. Um, for power lines, we can go out. Um, and most of our sites are located a few miles from any available power. And so go to the results. I think I can still change the slides on here. I just can't. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know if you could. So the results. Great. Okay. Um, so, like I said, we've been up there three years, and we've been developing this technology. So these are results from last year, which is our the first year that we had these biosensors functional and working and out in the environment, and. On the left, what we're looking at is a measure of current versus time between July, basically for the entire month of July. And in the, the black line is a shallow depth, so that's at about seven centimeters below the surface. The darker gray is, is a medium depth, it's about 10 centimeters below the surface. And the lighter, the light gray is uh, deep, which is about 14 centimeters below the surface. And this is about as thawed as things get up there over the summer. Somewhere between 15 and, and 18 centimeters is normally the maximum thaw depth that you see right now. And so what we want to, the, the kind of results that we can take out of this year is that we have these daily cycles in, in activity. And we can see this in the shallow um, depth for the entire time. 
and in the medium and deep depths for the second half of July. Now, one thing that's interesting here is that um, you might normally think, well, bacteria are, are on day-night light-dark cycles, but things are light for 24 hours out there uh, during this time. So these are actually temperature-driven fluctuations. Even though there are 24 hours of sunlight, the temperature still fluctuates based on the movement of the sun around the sky. And the second thing that we want to look at here is um, the fact that these daily cycles, which are uh, a result of these bacteria responding to soil cha changes in soil temperature, they're occurring in the shallow depth for the entire for the entire month of July. But if we look at the medium and deep depths for the first half, there's um, there aren't we don't see these daily cycles. There's basically existing at a background level, um, and then we get to about July 15th through the 21st, and all of a sudden we see that the medium depth jumps up, starts experiencing these cycles, and is basically the same um, same magnitude as this shallow depth. And the deep depth is, is following this behind. It doesn't quite reach the same magnitude, but we do see these daily cycles start to evolve. And this is interesting because what we're seeing is basically these bacteria that were fairly inactive in lower soil levels are becoming awakened um, as soil temperature increases. And on the right, what I've done here is I've taken uh, the medium depth, so the, the middle gray one uh, from the previous plot, and I've, I've looked at it against the soil temperature at that depth, which is the dotted line. And what we can see is that basically from July 1st to July 15th or 15th to 18th, the soil temperature is about on average three to three and a half degrees Celsius. And then after this, from July 18th or 19th onward, the average soil temperature is about five to five and a half degrees Celsius. So we see this jump of about two degrees in, between, in a period of a week in the middle of July. And this is what's driving the change in bacterial activity. So all of a sudden, these bacteria are becoming, becoming awakened. Um, and this is particularly frightening because you think that, well, things are going to keep falling a little bit deeper each year. So this is going to kind of continue to move down into the soil. So if we look at the, the kind of what's next, um, basically what we've done this and earlier also, yeah. So that, so um, that's right, sir. So. The things, the, the major concerns are, one, things are going to be falling deeper. So you think of the entire surface area of that tundra that I showed you, um, and you think about how many bacteria are going to be, kept, be active if we're falling one centimeter deeper into the soil each year, um, or, or something like that, or how many bacteria are going to be active if in five years it's, there's 10 centimeters more. Um, and also, they're going to be falling earlier and they're going to be awakened for longer over the summer. So there's a lot of factors going on. So the next step, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about our field season plans for this year. Um, and what we really want to focus in on now is one, we can detect these iron processes by bacteria going on. We want to know um, what happens to the methane emissions when we stimulate this, these iron, um, and also what are the major factors controlling um, microbial dominance. So we may find uh, that there are some environmental factors that are controlling um, whether the iron production or methanogenesis are, are dominant. And finally, we want to know, do current climate models accurately predict methane emissions from this site? And one thing that we found is that there seem to be um, a a lack of data sets for high latitude uh, soils that people have to test these emission models with. So there are a lot of, of data sets from um, mid and tropical latitudes, and, and the, the models are very good at predicting these, but we're not quite sure how well they're going to perform for these high latitudes um, because there just aren't, isn't that much data to be able to compare against. Um, 
on. Let me look at the question. Are the density of the microbes changing over depth? Uh, we're not sure yet, and that's actually something we're working on now, is looking at the actual bacteria that exist in these um, different layers of soils. So we're going to be um, sequencing the DNA from the bacteria in these soils, and we'll be able to tell uh, what bacteria are there and how they're changing over time and, and with different environmental factors. So finally, so conclusions. Um, I hope I've convinced you that methane is a major player in the climate change uh, equation. OK, am I talking about archaea or regular bacteria for, um, for that we're sequencing? Um, we're going to be looking at both. Um, I don't know if that's what the question was. Okay. Yeah, Julia, okay. if you want to ask your question, you, know, you could kind of raise your hand if you want to uh, use the talk. Okay. Well, I'll keep going, and whenever you I want to ask me, let me know. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that methane is, is kind of a major factor in, in this climate change equation, especially in the Arctic, um, and that Arctic soils are an important carbon reservoir. And um, we're not really sure how climate change will affect the carbon balance. And um, this is particularly important here because these are the areas that are experiencing the most pronounced climate change thus far. Um, Microbes are really a crucial component in the carbon cycle, um, and even, even at lower latitudes as well, but especially at these higher latitudes where we don't have as many plants, we have no trees, we basically have small grasses, and that's it. And then um, finally, uh, one thing is additionally the concern is that there's a large range of methane emissions predicted in current models. Um, and like I mentioned, one, one of the reasons for this is um, we don't have that much data from high latitude uh, sites. And so one thing we're trying to do is fill the gap um, there and improve these models uh, so that we can understand what might happen in different scenarios. And with that, uh, we'll acknowledge the people who helped me. So uh, the people in our lab, um, the ancient lab here at, at Cornell, um, are Miriam Rosenbaum and, and Alex Lee. They were responsible for uh, kind of helping me, helping the design of this uh, biosensor. And um, Devin Down and Michaela Taravis are, are the other uh, graduate students here working on these microbial electrochemical systems. Um, the Barrow field team includes uh, some members from San Diego State and Stanford who we collaborate with in this effort. And then our Polar Trek teacher from, from last year uh, Jim Miller from Cleveland Heights High School. Um, and we have the logistic providers, uh, BASC, CH2M, Polar Hill, and uh, following the funding from uh, NSF and Polar Trek. Nice. All right. So Thank you. with that, I'll uh, answer any questions. And uh, you can see my shameless self-promotion there. Uh, so. Hi. Our 2012 field season, including our Polar Trek teacher, Christina Solis, who's from LA Academy. And then also, um, other members of the Ancient Lab have uh, a high school curriculum available for building a type of microbial electrochemical system called the microbial fuel cell. And you can actually set this up in, um, in the lab, and you can power an LED with bacteria. So, um, if you want to take a look at that, it's available online, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about it or anything else. Yeah, um, Janet had a question of our most models from the or from the equator regions, and then I kind of had a question too. Where else in the high Arctic are they doing these studies? And when I looked for resources for our class, I found a lot of things. Under for uh, you know symmetry or under the oceans, does that count? Does that help you, Elliot? Um, well, I'm actually trying to pull out one of the lists here that um, will tell me where the other Arctic sites are. Um, in regards to the climate models, they're 
general climate models, um, but the, basically the way they do this is they take what data they have and they build a model to um, basically fit the data that they have. And, and then what they can do is, is um, you'll use a portion of your data to build the model, and then you'll use the rest of your data to test the model. So um, based on whatever amount of data you have, you take a small portion of it and you build your model to, to fit that and then you go back with the model that you, you get out of it and you test how accurate it is for these other sites. Um, I will try to find this table of locations. Um, so for example, in, in one, they do have a lot. They're, um, they have a lot from the mid-latitudes, so Brazil, Venezuela, Panama, um, New Hampshire, Michigan, China, um, and basically uh, most of the um, most of the high-latitude data set uh, data sets are from um, Sweden and that Finland and that area. There are also some from Siberia and Canada, and a few from Alaska, but um, they kind of that's that's the one where we're we're limited is is these Arctic um, high latitude data sets. Thanks. Uh, okay, um, Julia, you want to ask your question? So uh, go ahead. Um, getting back to that other one, I was trying to figure out what I was asking. Um, you are measuring the um, you're mimicking the iron in the soil by using the graphite um, and your it's the um, methanogenic bacteria which is the archaea their, their activity that you're measuring or do other anaerobic bacteria create methane correct or am I wrong in that first question um, okay so I, I think I can answer this one and then I know his question uh, kind of go together um, but so the archaea are the ones that produce methane, and there, there on the other side there are bacteria that um, can alternatively breathe with iron, and so they're not competing. What, what they do different processes, but they're competing for um, nutrients and food basically. Um, so the carbon and and the other limiting nutrients to growth, um, they're competing for these, and so. Basically, one will dominate um, if it has more favorable growth conditions, um, and so it's these iron um, bacteria that we're measuring. And the way we measure um, the activity of the me methanogens, the archaea, is to me measure the methane emissions that are coming out of the soil um, r right above where where we have our elect uh, our graphite. So what we can see is if, if we put these um, graphite pieces of graphite in and we're making the growth conditions more favorable to the iron bacteria, we would expect that there is less methane emissions coming out. And you can let me know if that helps. Um, I'll try to answer Noah's question to you. So have you tried to alter the balance of CO2 versus methane produced by adding iron to the system? Yeah, so we have done some background studies with that in the past. And um, basically, that's what we're going to be doing this year with the um, sensors is we're basically adding iron. For all intents and purposes, we're adding iron. Um, but one of the reasons is one of the reasons uh, we want to use this is because um, yeah, not to suggest geoengineering, but so one of the reasons we want to use the biosensor instead of adding iron is because in addition to being um, one of the electron acceptors, iron is also typically the one of the nutrients that limits bacterial growth in general. So there's lots of carbon, um, they need carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, iron, um, and other nutrients, and iron is one of the ones that typically limits how much growth you can have. And so if we add iron, um, we've done that and we see increased methane usually. Um, but 
then we still are are questioning. We actually we're, we're questioning whether is that because they're they're iron reducing? What's happening? Are iron reducing bacteria becoming more prevalent, or are we just growing more um, bacteria and methanogenic archaea because we've um, added extra nutrients to the system. So that's one of the main reasons that we want to use this biosensor is because we can make the iron available for the iron reducing bacteria without stimulating growth overall by providing more iron as a nutrient. Okay, great. So Anybody else have questions that you want to ask uh, live to, um, okay, go ahead, Melissa. Hi, Elliot, this is Melissa. Um, I'm a polar tech teacher, and I'll be up at Tulick this summer. And um, I just had a question in regards to talking to my students about um, methane producing. I always have said methane producing bacteria. And I, you know, I know that they are in the group Archaea. Um, am I, is it incorrect or should I be saying, should I be calling them Archaea instead of bacteria? That's my main question. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's a good question. Um, so in the past uh, like 15 to 20 years, we've basically change the way we, we, we do classify these organisms and maybe we can go back to the, I forget which slide it's on because I still can't see them, um, but the one with that phylogenetic tree, I have to look it up on my other computer where I have the things open. So it's methane. Is that, is that this one? I think so. Um, yeah, uh, but so basically, we, okay. So um, we've changed the way that we build these trees of life, uh, and that was basically catalyzed by the um, availability of sequencing. So now that we can sequence DNA, what we can do is we build these phylogenetic trees based on the similarity of the DNA in these organisms, and. Uh, <laughs> So kind of that old, uh, that older, uh, I guess at least what I learned in school was the five kingdom approach of, of the animals and, and fungus and everything. And we've, we've changed that to, uh, to be based on um, this DNA. So I guess, I don't know if it's, it's bad to say bacteria. I think if, if we want to include uh, well, if we want to, if we want to include uh, talking about both bacteria and archaea, um, I would say you could say microorganisms um, instead of bacteria. So, hopefully that that helps. Okay. Looks like um, let's see. Julia's got another question. Did you want to? Yeah, I just saw that um, for some reason my chat stopped okay. auto scrolling. So, um, are we combining <laughs> You're having combining any of these results of the changes in aerobic respiration and CO2 production in here? Yeah. So one thing we also want to see is um, we are measuring dissolved oxygen concentrations, um, and basically, specifically in these lakes and lake basins, there's not a lot of of, avail of aerobic respiration simply because um, it gets anaerobic so fast, and the reason for that is, um, I guess we can go to this next slide. Um, that's not the one I want. The Arctic one on the slide. So the water table is typically at or above the ground surface, and if you have that, um, what you'll have is basically you'll be totally anaerobic in the soil. Um, so there's very small areas where there there is some aerobic activity and one thing that we'll hopefully be able to see is differences when we do look at the um, bac microbial communities so what bacteria are, are living there um, we may be able to distinguish these uh, aerobic areas based on their their microbial communities okay 
Okay. Okay, Melissa, go ahead, ask a question. Um, yes, you mentioned um, that, and I don't know if this was an example you were giving or if there's actual data, um, but that the thaw depth of one centimeter per year, is that something that we've been seeing? Um, I'm curious because I'm going to be looking at thaw depth when I'm up there. Um, so I just wanted to hear what you knew about that. I know it's not quite directly in your project, but. Yeah, so um, I didn't mean to be misleading, but that one centimeter year was just a number I made up to, uh, to kind of maybe say, you know, if we think about to 200 miles by about 500 or 600 miles, there's a fairly large area, surface area. And then if right now only the, the top 15 centimeters are active, um, if you increase that even by one centimeter, that's, you know, that whole surface area um, is, a, is a large volume of soil where there's going to be more bacteria. Um, so it was just the number I made up. Um, but I will definitely follow your expedition and, and see what thought depth things you have. It's, it's one of the things we measure um, when we are up there, but I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Okay. Anybody else have questions? Mulling it over. All right. Well, it's almost time for us to wrap up here. Oh, people are typing, typing here. But um, in case uh, you didn't get a chance or you uh, to ask a question or you have more things to s you want to ask Elliot, we do have his email address. I'm sure he'd be happy to respond to things. And um, also, he does have access. If you're in the online class, he does have access to that discussion board as well. So, anybody? Anything? Yeah, Elliot, thank you so much. That was really great, and everybody's sending you some good thanks there. Yeah. Okay. All okay, right. Well, thanks. Well, um, yeah, and if yeah, anyone. Alan, thank you for taking that. Oh, I was just going to say, if anyone has questions, okay, you ahead, can feel Elliot, free to on. post on that message board or or email me or, or anything like that. All right. Yeah, and thank you for uh, taking the time, Elliot, to be with us and um, for everybody that joined us. And we will stay online here for a little bit longer. To, uh, um, Elliot, if you have a moment, we'd like to talk to you about some of your technical issues. Um, in the meantime. <laughs>